good with our, uh, for, for those of you that may have, well, first of all, I'm, I'm Philip Chiquette, and uh, I helped with the facilitation of the first Route 29 Solutions panel. And today is the first meeting of the project delivery panel, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the difference between, between the two. Um, I think we're good on our fire marshal rules, which uh, limit us basically to the seats that are in the room, but that all looks good. Before we get into the introductions, we'll just take care of two things that are important to take care of at the beginning of any, any meeting. Um, there are restrooms out of the door to the right, down the hall, and if for any reason there should be any emergency that requires us to leave this room, we go back down the steps uh, leading up here, out the front door, and just keep walking to the left till somebody says stop. So uh, hopefully that we won't need to uh, leave in any rush, but if we do, that, that would be the circumstance. I'll let you know also in advance that the meeting is being streamed live, so whoever might be out there watching uh, will, be, will be watching us. All the materials that you see today are also posted on a website, so for the public that may be watching, uh, you really won't get a good view of what's on our screen here, but if you're watching, online, you can go to route29solutions.org and find a list of the panel members as well as any materials that are being presented here today. Uh, before we go any further, I think it would be good for us just to do a general round of introductions uh, so we know who the players are. You're seated in alphabetical order, so there's no uh, mystery or preference or no game playing with where you're sitting. It's all pretty straightforward, assuming we got our alphabet right. So, Chip, why don't you? Be, be glad to. Uh, Chip Boyles, I'm the Executive Director for the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission and Metropolitan Planning Organization for Charlottesville Avenue. I'm Morgan Butler. I'm a senior attorney at the Southern Environmental Law Center, which is headquartered here in Charlottesville. And I'm also a resident of the Greenbrier neighborhood in Charlottesville. Uh, Eddie Giles, uh, owner of Professional Movers Incorporated, located here in Charlottesville, Virginia. And also, so I live on Hydraulic Road. Mark Graham, I'm the director of community development for Albemarle County, and I reside in Ivy. Satinder Hujan, we have Sidney Charles. I'm Chuck Lebo with Lebo Commercial Properties. I own uh, five properties in the Route 29 corridor, and my commercial real estate company manages uh, a little over half a million square feet of commercial property within, I'd say, a half mile of Route 29 and uh, Rio Road intersection. I'm John Nunley with Better Living, and I live in the Ivy area. I'm Jim Talbert, Director of Neighbor Development Services of the City, and I live in Greenbrier. Karen Weiner, Mall Manager for Sharpsville Fashion Square Mall. And just like in school, I'm the last guy to be. Henry Weintraub, CEO of the Express Car Wash Company. We'll go in reverse order. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are. Just for full disclosure, um, everybody's both of their domicile, I do live about a quarter of a mile from Own Rio, from the Rio and 29 Interchange. I live in Norfolk. So. <laughs> uh, there are two members of the panel who, when they accepted, knew they would not be able to be here today. So I just wanted to mention them. Pete Borches uh, from CMA Properties and Brad Sheffield, the Avonmore County, uh, County Supervisor. Uh, both of those folks were really hoping we could reschedule, but 10 out of 12 were good for today. I've committed to both of them to, they're very interested in knowing what transpires today. I've committed to both of them to follow up personally with a, with a phone call and share any information with them that was shared, to, uh, that we share with each other today. Let's let the VDOT folks and staff folks introduce themselves as well so we know who our technical team is. 
I'm Lou Hatter. I'm the uh, communications manager for VDOT for the Culpeper District and now for the uh, Route 29 projects. I'm Paul Frito, consultant support to VDOT. I'm Chuck Proctor. I work in the planning section in Culpeper District office. Kyle Jones, project management office in Culpeper District. Dave Covington, regional program manager of VDOT. Ken Roof, information technology. I'm the stream guy. <laughs> He's keeping our televisions working. Joel. I'm Joel Benante. I'm the residency administrator for PDOC and Charlottesville residency. Pat Cindy Tung, CTV member for Culpeper District. And then John Lynch, Culpeper District administrator. Debbie Messina. I work with Philip Chiquette. All right. Uh, I've got a. Uh, I've got a. Uh, just a few slides. They're at your desk, but we'll look at them on the screen. They're available online as well. That will sort of help guide us through the first uh, five agenda items. Uh, today is obviously an introductory meeting, sort of find our, our footing. Uh, so we'll go ahead, Ken, and that will help us a bit. Thank you very much. Uh, at your desk, there, or at your desk, at the table, there is a list of panel members, uh, a collective list. Your email addresses are on there. We are a public body. We're forming a public function here, so your contact information will be on that Route29Solutions.org website. Uh, if I have misstated your your title or any of, of your email address, just please let me know so I get that uh, get that correct. But it's important for the public to know who is on the panel. The charge to the panel that was given to me from the VDOT commissioner, if you remember the last times from the, the secretary, got a group of people together and basically asked that first group what we should do. That part's over. So our job is focused on the how are we going to, to do it. So our, our charge is to advise VDOT during the development and the delivery. You could read that design and construction, however you want to read it, development and delivery of the Route 29 package projects on matters regarding design, environmental permitting, construction, maintenance of traffic, and public safety. Pretty straightforward charge, not any surprise there. Uh, it's just clearly the emphasis is on how to deliver these, these projects, and we'll review the projects in a, in a bit. Uh, we've got opportunities and some responsibilities. Uh, our, our opportunities or input uh, cover some very broad elements. Uh, we can provide advice regarding the procurement process. In other words, VDOT is going to have to hire a contractor to deliver these projects. There's a process for doing that that VDOT has to follow, but there are opportunities for us to input. We'll talk about those more specifically. Provide advice regarding the qualification and evaluation of contractor teams. People are going to say, yes, I'm interested in delivering this project. VDOT is going to go through an evaluation process to determine who the contractor team will be. Uh, provide advice regarding key design elements. We're not going to be designing any pipes or anything like that here, but we will have opportunity to talk about some key design features. Uh, provide advice regarding key construction elements, and that's a big field, con you know, staging of construction, uh, maintenance of traffic, we, we mentioned signing. Uh, that, that, will, that will be a key focus area for us, I'm, I'm betting, because I think this next to the last bullet is pretty important to everyone here, and that is how are you going to maintain traffic during a construction period? And also provide feedback and monitoring during construction. Uh, 
I've been asked to keep the panel, while our frequency of meeting may change, to keep the panel together through the construction process so there are opportunities to continue to provide, provide feedback. We've got some responsibilities, no surprises here. Do the best we can to attend to the meetings. Y'all are busy, busy folks. I mean, there's two, there's a, uh, two folks from the city, the mayor and Mr. Talbert, uh, two folks from the county, you know, Mr. Sheffield and Mark Graham, uh, Morgan and Chip, and then six of you are, are, you know, busy business people. We respect that, but we'll do our best to make a good faith effort to attend panel meetings. You'll have some information to study, not a lot of homework, but, but in order to provide feedback, You'll have some documents to review. Uh, we want your constructive advice regarding project delivery on, on the how to do it. Uh, respect differing opinions. Uh, we're not going to vote on who's right and who's wrong. We'll respect all opinions that come up on the table and make sure we provide those appropriately to VDOT. And then I think this last one is pretty important. You, you all represent a lot of other people. I mean, quite frankly, whether they're your customers uh, or your, your constituencies, if you're elected uh, officials. And I think it is important uh, to communicate with them. The more information and feedback you can bring to the table here, the better this process will be because what we don't want to do is get at the end and just say we had meetings and finished. We want to say that we provided some input that helps John and his team deliver these projects in the field. Uh, what are the projects and I'm guessing everybody here knows what the package projects are but we'll review them just quickly. Uh, the package, if you'll remember, included the full funding of some projects that already were in VDOT's six-year plan, and then the funding of some, the full funding of some additional projects. Uh, these projects in no particular order. Uh, the widening of Route 29 North from Polo Grounds to Town Center Drive, adding a lane in each direction. There's some mix of existing and new right away uh, for that for that project. I keep calling it the Best Buy ramp and shouldn't since the ramp isn't just for Best Buy. Uh, but I'll have to break that. Maybe by the end I'll break that in. So uh, this is not the ramp for Best Buy, but it is the 29-250 widening of the ramp near Best Buy. We'll be adding a merge lane and a second ramp lane. The Hillsdale Drive extension from Hydraulic Road to, to Greenbrier, constructing one lane, generally one lane in each direction with some appropriate turning lanes. Hillsdale South from Holiday Drive to Hydraulic, and we'll have some more conversation about that particular project. This is actually a piece of Hillsdale that was added as a result of the discussions at the first panel uh, panel meeting, the first advisory panel. Uh, the Burkmar Drive extension from Hilton, uh, Hilton Heights Road to Town Center Drive, and I think there's still some analysis to do there in terms of lane configurations uh, and the sort. And then the Rile Road grade separation intersection which I imagine will take up a fair amount of our time in terms of discussion over the next, over the next few weeks. And last, the adaptive signal timing uh, project, which I 20 some traffic signals that would be a time. I don't remember, 26 or 22. 22, 22. I had the 20 part, correct. Um, as far as uh, how we will meet and how we will conduct our business, uh, we'll use the same philosophy that we had with the first advisory panel. 
All of our meetings will be open to public attendance, but not for public comment. And that's not to shut out people that take the time to attend. Uh, this just these aren't public meetings in that sense. Uh, welcome people to come and attend in public and certainly to view on online. Uh, mentioned that the meetings will be streamed live. We'll continue to use the Route29Solutions.org website. There are forms available for comment on that website. The last time, round numbers, a couple of hundred people took advantage of, the, of using the comment forms. Lou Hatter will be monitoring uh, any public input that comes in from the website, and we'll share that, we'll share that with you. Uh, once again, the, these meetings will be available on VDOT's YouTube channel if somebody wants to review them uh, later. And frankly, several hundred people did that through the first panel process. Uh, I mentioned that we won't that we won't vote, uh, so we won't vote. And just while our input is important and we're doing important business, we don't have the ability to bind VDOT or bind a, a contractor. We can provide meaningful input, and uh, John and his team are going to be here to carefully con consider it. Uh, the project delivery approach, objectives, and schedule. Uh, I can say with all fairness and frankness that VDOT is, is moving quickly. Uh, VDOT is on a, on a hot path here since the approval and funding of the project and has looked basically at three procurement methods or three methods of delivering the project. The first is the traditional design, bid, build. Uh, you design what you want to do, you take that design, put it out, contractors bid on that design, and then some contractor builds what they bid on. We're not going to talk about the relative value of each one of these processes, uh, and I would try not to get too hung up on it, only to say that here, design is done separately. What's designed is put out to bid, and contractors bid on what someone else designed. That is currently planned to be used for the Best Buy, for the Best Buy ramp, for the ramp at Best Buy. Uh, and currently for the Hillsdale extension. The city of Charlottesville has been managing that project. Uh, you've seen some correspondence in, or maybe some articles here and there lately uh, that may continue to be developed by the city. It may become part of the VDOT package. There's no argument or fussing going on. It's just simply an opportunity to roll them up into the package, if that's what the ultimate conclusion should, should be. But right now, they would be part of the uh, design, bid, build process. Uh, the district has some on-call services for the adaptive timing. That just means that they've already gone through some procurement process, and they've got some folks on board that they can use to deliver the adaptive signal timings. Unless you want to, I don't see us spending a lot of time on that particular, that particular area. The Route 29 widening, the Hillsdale South, Burkmar, and the Rio Grade separated intersection. So plans are to roll all of those projects up into one design build procurement. An announcement that a package is available for contractors to look at and what that package will say, what that request for qualifications will say is, this is all with respect to the design build package now, what that request will say is, here are projects we're interested in building 
here are some key outcomes that we want to be sure we get with respect to schedule and maintenance of traffic and a list of things that we'll have a chance to talk about. And if you're interested in sending us your qualifications to do this work, we'd love to look at them, okay? The request for qualifications will contractors will have, teams will have about a month to submit their qualifications and the request will say, here's what we want to see from you. We want to know that you're real, that you're licensed, that you're not debarred. There will be some important business things that will have to be in there. And then there will be some other stuff that sort of tell us why, you know, tell us why you think you're more qualified to do this than someone, someone else. That will be uh, evaluated then in about the next 30 days and some teams, and I don't know how many VDOT plans to do right now, will be shortlisted. In other words, they may get qualification packages from 10 groups of contractors and designers, and they could theoretically thank seven of them for submitting and choose three to shortlist. However many are shortlisted on October the 2nd, will receive a request for proposals, another government term, but the difference here is here it was saying, tell us what your qualifications are. This is cutting to the chase and say, okay, tell us how you're going to deliver these projects and tell us how much they're, what your, what your price is going to be. This will be reviewed in two steps, technical, technical proposals will be reviewed. This is the, the more technical part of the construction delivery. And then, and then at some point later, VDOT would open the price. So it's not low bid. It's best value. Okay? In other words, the technical <laughs> approach Coupled with a uh, coupled with the price, will determine how VDOT selects a final a final contract. The schedule is in January uh, to give a notice of intent. John Nunley, we picked you. We're letting you know that we intend to award a contract to you, and then that recommendation will go to the Commonwealth Transportation Board who will have to approve an award to a particular contractor. I can tell you with a high degree of reliability, I think VDOT's going to meet every one of these days. The high degree of reliability. Because they've got a solid plan in place. They've assembled a technical team. For those of you that were here last time, I think you saw that when VDOT puts a technical team together, they do pretty good business. So uh, between now and February, there will be a lot of activity happening that we will want to have input into. Uh, we'll do that at meetings. There may be some things that happen that I'll call you or get a note out to you and uh, ask for input on, on different issues, but we'll figure that out as we, as we, work, as we work through it. You may have seen some people, you may have seen notices, or if you're an elected official, you may have heard from people who have received notices or seen folks out in the, out in the field. Some field work is already underway. Uh, two big categories, surveys and investigations for various types of engineering data, ground elevations, property lines, geotechnical surveys, and also surveys for the environmental work that needs to be done and for compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act and for environmental permitting, folks are out in the field looking at wetlands, architectural surveys for uh, historic properties, 
as well as um, hazardous material areas that may be out. So if if someone says, gee, folks are already out there, I saw somebody paint, yeah, they, they, they are. And they're doing the same kind of work that's done in the field for every project done anywhere. So there's nothing mysterious uh, about that. Uh, that helps us take a look at the first five agenda items, and which we've covered a lot of ground. I thought we let's take a pause there and take any questions, observations. Uh, that anyone has about those first five items before we jump off into, into item six. So we reviewed our charge, the projects, uh, how we're going to collect input from the public, and we talked about the general delivery schedule. I have one item. Well, Chris, uh, you discussed Especially Hillsdale Drive Station. It says it goes from Holiday Hydraulic Road to Holiday Drive. The recollection of we discussed, I missed the last meeting, that uh, it was very good of hydraulic 250 bypass. The, uh, the Hillsdale South piece that we're talking about for everyone came up in these discussions and it was discussed from hydraulic south to 250 and then there was some discussion about holiday or hydraulic south just a holiday drive drive and uh, the recommendation that was made and approved was hydraulic south the holiday drive and for, for one key reason, when you touch 250 in the area of that 250-29 interchange, you open up a whole lot of other, of other issues. Uh, I think those issues will come up as well as part of the hydraulic road preliminary engineering studies that are done at some point in the future. So the recommendation that was made and approved by the CTB was to just fund the piece to uh, Holiday Drive and not get involved with the 250-29 interchange now. And uh, I know there's a lot of discussion between the city and, and VDOT on that going on. And I think that needs to play out. It's fair to say, well, does that really provide a lot of benefit if it doesn't tie to 250? Uh, <clears throat> is that a project to move forward now, or should it wait and be considered as part of the hydraulic road, grade separated interchange uh, design study? And I just think that's something that we need we need to have your staff and VDOT keep talking about and then report back to you on. John, do you want to? No, I think that's a fair assessment. We need, we need to look at that. Yeah. So it, that's why it stopped at Holiday Drive. So are you saying that we can discuss with VDOT this extension to 250 bypass maintain? I think you can d discuss discuss it with VDOT in, in the meantime. I think the discussion will be more around the timing of that piece rather than whether or not we're going to extend it to 250 now. Does that make sense? I think, yeah. I think that's what Council Monday night said, is, yes. is, is if you build it without the extension, it may just function as a local road to not do anything for the solutions mm -hmm. that this is aimed at. and. We need to make sure it works in the package yeah. that it was originally intended. So, yes. So I think that discussion will go on between the, your staff and VDOT, and then we'll report we'll report back to you. 
I'm trying to make sure I understand on the project delivery objectives, the complete uh -huh. rail grade separated intersection. Uh -huh. Am I reading that and understanding that to mean somewhere between in 2016? Can you go back to that page? And it was a page 10 on the handout. But okay. There we go. Just trying to make sure I understand that is saying that that inter grade separation will be completed sometime in 2016 between the final exercises at UVA and the first football game of that fall season? Close. <laughs> All right. The, the no excuses date for Rio grade separated would be between final exercises and the first football game 2017. All right. The contractor will be incentivized financially to complete it a construction season early between finals and the first football game in 2016. Right. Thank you. Well, when will it begin? Construction should be, construction will be, of these package of projects underway a year from now. So you're saying that will be built in one year's time? In one, the contractor would be incentivized to construct that in one year's time. Seems like quite a huge undertaking for a large intersection. It, uh, it, it, I don't think it's an unreasonable undertaking, particularly with a, a team. It is a big undertaking. Uh, I think that with the right incentives in place, which is why this request for qualifications is important, because this isn't something just anybody could pull off. But there are contractors in Virginia that can definitely do, do it. circle back around. Will the VDOT project team, I know all of our contact information, because I didn't catch everyone's name as they went around the room, is that going to be posted on You know what, I'll, I will pull a similar list, that's an excellent suggestion. I will pull a similar list together for the VDOT technical team and get that to everyone and we will put that on the on the web as well. With, that was okay. Question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Second question. Well, okay. I just, I'm, I just okay. want to make sure I got my, I'm, I got Mark. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you good? No. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Karen. Sorry to get you um, Regarding the interchange, what portion of the funding is federal funding, and is there a full environmental impact study required to meet federal funding requirements, and is that built into this time frame? This yeah. Thing? The, the, I, the answer, I'll start at the back. Is it built into the time frame? Yes. Is there an environmental is there an environmental study requirement? Yes, but it is the least type of study that meets NEPA because the National Environmental Policy Act. The, this project does not require an environmental impact statement. It doesn't require an environmental assessment. It can be done with what's called a categorical exclusion because it is within existing right of way. And that's a specific <clears throat> a specific process mm -hmm. that meets the requirements of the National Environmental Policy Act. And then do, do all the projects also meet the House Bill 2 um, impact consideration and studies as well? The, uh, House Bill 2 was passed by the General Assembly the last session which sets up a project prioritization process. These projects do not go through that process because they were approved and placed in the six-year improvement plan in advance of the start of the House Bill 2 process. And the House Bill 2 process starts? Now, July. July. Well, plan has to be in place Right. We're beginning the yeah, process now. Yeah, that's right. But beginning the process now, the plan has to be in place by next year, but these projects don't have to go through House Bill 2. Well, may I ask what the time frames are for the other projects, such as the Hillsdale Extension, <coughs> or the uh, Burt Martin Drive Extension, 
We, I was under the understanding that those roads would be built prior to doing anything on 29 so that when you start disrupting the traffic on 29, travelers have another way to commute north and south to avoid that what's going to be a very busy intersection under construction. Mm -hmm. I thought those other roads would be built first. It sounds like everything's going to happen all at once. Uh, VDOT is finalizing a schedule now for the for the sequence delivering of the projects. But while there was a lot of there was a lot of input that the other uh, projects should be done first, that is not necessarily the path that we're that we're on. If if this project if a contractor takes up the incentives to deliver RIO grade separated by this time period of 2016, they'll be ahead of, of others. Has VDOT studied the impact on businesses? If you all, if the grade separated intersection, is it done before those side roads? Well, I think, Mr. Nunley, it's, it's what, when you say impact on businesses, uh, VDOT has looked at conceptually <coughs> what's required to deliver that particular project and generally what maintenance of traffic schemes might work. But the contractors will be asked to bring forward I specific ideas, and it will only be then that you really have a good handle on what's the traffic situation going to be like through <clears throat> that area during construction. So I think that's why it's important for, for us and for VDOT to be careful and clear about what what are the outcomes that we're expecting here. You know, now has somebody done a study to say that we 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 believe that such and such a business is going to lose X percent of their revenue? No. And I wouldn't I wouldn't foresee VDOT doing a study like that. And you said it was going to be done within the uh, right of ways. How are you and VDOT going to maintain four levels, four lanes of traffic and build this intersection within the right of way? Well, there's going to need to be an identification of some construction staging areas. There's going to need to be a review of means and methods for constructing the separated portion of the, of the project. In other words, the piece that would keep traffic moving through the, the intersection, uh, as well as maintain the existing number of lanes that offer turning movements across the intersection. But there again, VDOT's going to have to state what their goals and objectives are and these shortlisted teams of contractors come forth with plans on how they're going to accomplish that. Now, it's possible that VDOT can say, none of this accomplishes our objectives. It's possible. I don't think that will be the case. But as those plans come forward, We'll have an opportunity to review those as well and provide input into that. Um, no design build project is purely design build. I understand that a design build is like you're hiring an architect mm -hmm. to design your house, and then you go out with those plans from the architect mm -hmm. out for bids. But no family hires a builder and says, build me a house, mm -hmm. without giving the builder some right. kind of sketches, right. stuff like that. So my question is, how much preliminary design are we going to see prior to October 7th? 
Uh, VDOT has, uh, Henry's correct. Design build doesn't mean that you just say build, build an intersection. Uh, there are varying levels of detail that are developed and given to uh, prospective design builders, sometimes as much as, and this is a term that even 40 years later, I'm not sure I understand completely what it means, 30% design. In other words, it said in simple terms, well, we'll do about a third of it and give you the general outlay. You figure out the rest. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe the intent is to do that much preliminary design here. But there will be some general design that will be done by consultants, engineers that VDOT has already lined up for Rio, for Berkmar, Route 29 and, and the Route 29 wide. So there will be some general design parameters that we'll have a chance <coughs> to see and provide input into. Did I miss great separated Rio Road among the primary engineering? No, that's in there. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because that will require some uh, thorough work and analysis, and it may be 30% in terms of man hours of design. So preliminary engineering is preliminary engineering. You lay out the basic, right. the basic geometry, That's right. the number of lanes, uh, the basic sequencing. Uh, yes, it that may take 30%, it may take even less than 30%, it may only take 10%. But it's crucial. But there will be some general, yes, absolutely. What we're really doing. Absolutely. And when can we see those plans? Uh, we'll know between now and our next meeting. We'll have a better idea of all the detailed schedules in between those major milestones. Uh, and you'll have, that's one thing I want to talk about before we get out of here on item seven is you know, I, I think our frequency of meeting between now and the end of the year will be pretty intense if we're going to really take advantage of our opportunities to have input into these into these processes. But well, flip back to those schedules. If uh, page eleven, maybe the other the other yeah here. Uh, before October, we'll have an opportunity to have input into the preliminary drawings, preliminary engineering that you're talking about. Because on October 2nd, they're going to be in that this RFP package will include that general information. But it's going to be done between now and October 2nd. Hopefully uh, a lot sooner than October 2nd. Well, October it will be done a lot October sooner October than October, October. Uh, that, that, Yeah, <laughs> It won't time, be finished the night of the 1st. By that time, you cannot say anything anymore because they're not going to be able to the contractors. No. We'll, so uh, I'm we'll very anxious to see that as soon as possible. And, and VDOT does have a separate engineer for Rio, a separate for RAP 29, a separate one for Berkmar, and then Baker is continuing their work to sort of overlook all of it because they have a tremendous amount of information from the first panel sessions that are already already developed. Okay. Chip. So, um, and I'm just assuming too that prior to October 2nd with the RFPs, we will have had a chance to, to perhaps give our emphasis that sequencing is a priority to be included in the proposals so that somebody submitting a consulting group or, or a contractor would not put less priority on the sequencing so they could hit the incentive deadlines. Just to show that, that sequencing may be a real priority to us 
for this project. And then whoever selected from the RFP, you know, would, would have met those objectives. Well, we're, we're going to have an opportunity to put our feedback on the table uh, uh, in an organized manner, regardless of what the feedback might be. I mean, I, to me, what's important is, is let's say, and I'm just using this as an example, that three people felt sequencing was important and three people felt it didn't matter. We're not going to pick between the who wins and who loses. I think we would say, look, let this information speak for itself. Here's, here's why some think it's important. Here's why others don't. But VDOT's going to have to take all that information and the decision on how to proceed is going to sit there. That's why this early, you're exactly right, this early feedback is, is important. What I will have for you as soon as this detailed schedule is fleshed out, because I, I want to give VDOT the opportunity they deserve, they're managing this, to, to really take a look at all of the details between these dates and on. And then once they're comfortable, share that, share that with you. And I think between now and the next meeting, you can probably expect a note from me that with an attachment that gives you all of those dates based based on the planning, the thoughts that are in process now, and you're going to see here's an early timeline and here's a late, an early finish and a late. Because I, I, I will say again, we're, we're, this horse didn't trot out of the gate. It's, it's, running, it's running fast. And that doesn't mean it's bad. It's bad. I, I think, personally, the worst projects I've seen are ones that take too long, not ones that are done, done reasonably quick, but not carelessly so. so. Mark, you had your hand up next. Yeah, I just had a question while we're on this schedule. Are, is VDOT anticipating all four of these projects being under one contract, or is it four separate contracts or a mix and match? Or? For the design build contracts, the plan is that they will all be under one contract. All four projects. All four projects would be under one contract, which provides more opportunities for how they're delivered. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, I've never done that. This is kind of a first, I think, uh, for 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 projects that are pretty distinct. Uh, so, but they'll all be under one. The design build projects, with or without Hillsdale, depending on how that works out, uh, will be one contract. One contract. Thank you. May, may I ask why? I mean. Uh, well, I'll let John. I, I think I know why I would do it, but I'll let John. Answer. Well, I mean, one of one of the, the primary reasons is in terms of, you know, basically you're getting um, a bigger bang for your buck in terms of you have fixed costs on every construction project, so mobilization, other management, overhead, and everything else. So by combining all these, you're gonna you're gonna get efficiencies there. Uh, also, in terms of the proximity of the projects, the uh, the area that's that's rather con condensed, uh, efficiencies in dealing with one contract entity rather than trying to coordinate with four or five different contractors to coordinate uh, phasing of the projects, lane closures, and different different aspects. So that that was the the basic thought process of combining all of the one. The, the, the reason I ask why is that I've seen. Builders trying to build five houses at one time, and uh, they're short on some manpower, so they shift all of their energy to one house, the four houses, or three houses, or two houses are sitting with nobody working on it for a week or two. Then they get some manpower, and they go back to this project, and they go to this project. I mean, just uh, this seems logistically, if you had four companies doing four each, each one of these projects, one of them wouldn't be sitting idle for any period of time. Well, I mean, a couple of things. I think I think you're looking at when you look at the, the procurement process of design build. Um, some of the aspects in the the request for qualifications are going to address those issues. Obviously, it's going to have to be somebody that has resources to do all these projects in that time frame, and that 
that's going to eliminate certain companies. Also, we're asking for innovation in terms of how can we do that this effectively and efficiently to try to minimize the uh, disruption during construction. So, you, you know, again, I think our procurement process and the, our, the qualifications portion of that is going to get the type of firms that are going to be able to be successful in these projects and not the ones that have to work on one thing at a time. Uh, I would say just from... You know, I do a lot of work on the private side as, as well. And combining these projects is going to bring some contractors to the, the table that definitely have the resources and the ability to, to deliver them uh, and that have some, some experience with innovation. And it's certainly nothing against smaller con contractors, but they just have more experience, resources, and capabilities that otherwise just probably wouldn't be interested in, in bidding on, on Berkmar, let's say. So I, I think it's a I think it's a good approach that that VDOT is on here in terms of packaging the projects from a flexibility point of view, from a contract management point of view and from getting the talent at the table that this is going to re require. Uh, you know, I, Eddie? Okay. Yes, sir. No, go ahead, please. No, I just had a question. A, a job of this magnitude, would the contractors be required to work how many, six days a week? Uh, Y'all got a time frame? I mean, for how many days they can work? I mean, they have to work six days a week, seven days a week? I mean, they've they been doing jobs at nighttime just to get the projects well, I, done? I, th there, I think a bigger issue might be when 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 won't they be allowed to work? In other words, the city, the city and the county may have certain ordinance. John would be more familiar with this. That says, look, we normally don't allow construction at two o'clock in the morning or or at night. I don't know some other localities. I'm familiar with what those limits are. But John, you want to speak to the well, I, I working think, time? I think the, the the issue that we we need to to resolve is simply when those when is the most convenient times for for everybody in terms of when to, to work. We you know completed the, the Beltway. It was a 1.4 billion dollar project. Uh, in about it was it was three years of construction time by the time they got things going. Um, primarily all at night. I mean we did hundreds of Beltway closures um, at nighttime because that was the time where traffic was uh, at, a, at a point where we could take maximum uh, benefit from, from the low traffic volumes. A lot of the businesses, obviously most of the businesses are closed at that time. There's not a lot of people traveling about. Um, so, I mean, we need to look at that and we basically come up with um, a limitation on operations based on traffic volumes and, and, and those and then what we're going to have to work with both the city and the county uh, to resolve if there are ordinances that might prohibit work at that particular time. And night is, is a primary example is where we could get a lot of this stuff done with minimal disruption. Um, but again, that's a, a concern with, you know, maybe a concern in terms of the community. But I, right. I think that's really where we want to want to look to, to minimize that. Um, in the RFP, John, you stop me about saying anything wrong. In the RFP, I imagine and would encourage there be some general description of when work will be permitted and when work will be prohibited, but also leave enough flexibility in the RFP that if a contractor, a contracting team says, you know what, we've really got a, we've got a great idea here that we want to put on the table, but it means that you're going to have to change a few of these limits. Well, we want to see the idea. We may think it stinks and encourage VDOT not to accept it, or VDOT may reject it for other reasons. But we want to leave that opportunity for innovation open because I, I'm i a big fan of the contracting industry in the Commonwealth of Virginia. There's some real smart ladies and men out there, and uh, we want to give them the opportunity to put their ideas on the table within some general parameters, like Kim said. Yes, sir. One more thing. Yes, sir. Uh, the other, well, the other question, the other concern I was 
want to ask too is, as far as construction of the track being built, I know I know at certain times of the day and certain events there's going to be a lot of traffic and high volume of traffic. What measurements the VDOT is thinking about is going to take as far as the safety of communities in certain areas in the community of people taking detours, come in, say, for example, coming down 29, if the back floor of traffic is backed up, they're going to might get on Rile Road and come down 29. You've got schools there, you've got churches and you know, certain communities. So what are they going to put restrictions up for us and making sure trucks and track controllers don't try to detour and take a shortcut and more high volume of traffic going to these neighborhoods? The, 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 short, the short answer is that, yes, they, they could put up certain restrictions. And, and they could put up certain restrictions and prohibitions on the contractors. But what VDOT is also doing, I don't know if it started yet, but VDOT is taking baseline traffic counts through all the communities and neighborhoods around the project so that if there is a huge blip somewhere during construction that everybody's cutting through a particular neighborhood will know about it and be able to react to it. John, you want to? So, so we had this, this similar situation again on the on the Beltway where we took baseline traffic data. Um, we set up parameters for, uh, and and I remember right offhand what those were. But for example, if speed increased on a certain roadway by 25% or volume, um, you know, no, you basically you're, you're you're getting a, a, a spike in in traffic volume on a, a residential roadway that we really want people either speeding or trying to if they're just cutting through, uh, then we would implement certain strategies to do that. It might be enforcement, uh, working with the with the uh, local law enforcement. It may be uh, we had we had a stockpile of mobile uh, speed bumps, traffic bumps, so slow traffic down, and try to try to uh, deter them from cutting through uh, local neighborhoods. But those types of strategies, we, we we're gathering the data now, and and something that will develop a plan to address those issues and when they come up. And I think as we get that information, it's important to share it with you to know that we've got the baseline information and this is what it's showing us. Yes, sir. One more question. Absolutely. You know, as you know, being on the panel here, I have a, question, a couple of questions and concerns, but also I'm questioning, you know, with this, I'm making sure we're looking down the road for the future, the helm of the, the volume of traffic coming through to the alternative that was supposed to discuss in the past, but and make sure this is not going to be a band-aid for something temporarily, thinking 25, 30 years down the road. I think there are people that will say it's a band-aid and some people that will say it's doing too much. Uh, uh, I, I, I hear you. You know, personally speaking, uh, I don't think you ever finish with uh, seldom in a growing urban area do you, do you finish. Uh, thinking about down the road and how your transportation facility might look. I've come to think of it more over my career. I've tried to stop thinking about the traffic as much as more mobility and accessibility because the way people move around and access things have changed so dramatically over, over my career. Um, I don't believe anybody will stop looking down the road. I mean, Chip has a job to make sure people keep looking down the road, particularly on the elected sides, and VDOT has the same responsibility. Uh, I think this is a, I think, I think this package of projects is the right package uh, for where we are in 2014 and demonstrates an ability to, to take some steps forward to make things better than they are. They won't, it won't fall in out of the sky. So there'll be some, there'll be some moments when we need some bad days. And, and then we may be thinking in the road in the future, we can figure out something to go around all the traffic and, and bypass all that. But also, um, all the question is, what, uh, what measurements is VDOT taking for the volume of traffic for any reason for emergency vehicles? Like, for example, if there was a bad accident and the ambulance trying to get to the University of Virginia and all this construction going on, I mean, what? Oh, that, that, that will be an important part of the maintenance and protection of traffic, maintenance of traffic plans. Uh, and that, again, will be something 
that when those maintenance of traffic plans come forward, I think everybody in here is going to be real engaged about that. And and we may want to see, you know, sh show me how that's going, show me how that's going to work. But the the consideration of emergency vehicle access through any construction zone is is an important item and I know we'll have an opportunity to hear more about that. Absolutely. Okay. Morgan? I want to piggyback on a point that Henry made. Um, I think Henry was kind of focused on some of the dates and saying the earlier we can get some of these preliminary yeah. ideas, the better in terms of our group being able mm -hmm. to provide the most valuable input. What I also want to say, I know mean, you made the joke about homework, but I think in thinking about each individual meeting and the frequency of those meetings, I think the extent we can get some of the information prior to the meeting, have a chance uh, yes. to review that, share that with our constituencies, we'll then be able to come to the table in these meetings with some more thoughtful input, yeah. as opposed to trying to just get things in front of us that day, respond and provide. No, I've, I've, already, I've already put steps in measure to get us to draft RFQ. There's a smidge of an issue there from a procurement process point of view that's being checked out with the Attorney General's office. And that's, if we get an advanced copy of a request for qualifications, we can't carry it off to our favorite contractor before VDOT puts it out on the street. That sets up some conflict of interest issues. So what we may have to do is we may have to have, we may have to sign a confidentiality agreement to review in advance the request for qualifications. But what I've asked uh, Shalendra to figure out real quick with the Attorney General is either we can or can't do that. And if we can't have the draft, uh, physically have the draft RFQ in our hands, then we're going to think real fast about another way to get our input into VDOT. But, but Morgan, I'll make a, a commitment to, to the panel that as information becomes available, I'm going to, we're, we're going to use a lot of electronic processes here to get it into your hands in advance. Because, for example, it would do no good to show up here two weeks from now and have John say, the, well, I'm happy to tell you that we met our first deadline and all we can do is just kind of sit around and look at each other. So uh, there, there, there will be a flow of, of information. And I'm going to do that in a way that makes sure we're compliant with the Freedom of Information Act. The information is posted up on our our website. Uh, I mean, it, there's some serious business here. That we have to make sure we do we do properly. Jim, and then uh, Karen. Two questions. One is where did the hydraulic uh, grade separated interchange PE go in all this? And then the other is. What are the limits of the adaptive signal timing project? The hydraulic is out three, four. Yeah. We believe it's 2019. I think it's out. Its funding it's is out four okay. years. So it's four nice. years from now. So it's not. It's not part of this. It's part of the Route 29 Solutions package. It's not part of the projects that are being we're considering for construction. Um, the limits of the adaptive, I don't know why I can never remember. Um, primarily, it's it's from, and Chuck can provide the details, I hope, right? Yeah. If I mess up, let me let me see if I can remember. Primarily, it's it's from 250, 29 north to airport road. So it does include, you know, the first signal south of, of the interchange at, at 29, 250, where Bodo's is, I forget the name of the road, but... It does include 250 hydraulic, and then every signal along 29 going up up the corridor. So that's the 22 signals. That does, uh, doesn't go to barracks, is what you're saying, or, right. or Ivy, like yeah. 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 The city of Baton Rouge Ivy. We talked about earlier, outside of Ivy Road. Well, and, that, and then again, that I think in terms of what was what was estimated and put forth during the original panel meeting, that was that project. And we still have working through the issues with the city portion of it. So that doesn't include the, the city's project. 
the additional the additional signal to the city city's concern. So that doesn't mean there can't be additional signals. Right. I think I think the concern is our city reps on the first panel understood that it was to include the city portion when it went forward and there's confusion about that. That's that's been a concern. Then we'll 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 bring back a real clear picture for you on that. And there again is I mean you're you all are talking to each other every day so let's don't let that stop. Karen. Two questions on the scheduling again on the surveys the field surveys and activities beginning in July different things going on geotechnical list here wetlands architecture. What's the timing on that and will those results be published as well? Will those results be public? Well the environmental ones certainly will because those will be captured in the in the categorical exclusion document. Well some of them will be in a category some of them are for the categorical exclusion some of them will be for environmental permitting because a project will still if a project requires a permit it has to get a permit. We'll be able to see the results of at least the environmental surveys. The engineering information we can we can see I don't know how interesting it'll be but it's interesting to me and John. But sure sure as John keep us posted as that information comes in we'll we'll know we'll know which we'll know the surveys are done and we'll know what information is available and if we want to review it sure. I know it started and I don't know when you I don't know I just don't know. Dave or John do you know if we have a yeah I mean we do it's it's all around the the it will be soon soon in the next few months but it'll it that will fall out in that detailed schedule that I'm going to get just as soon as the district has a has a little chance to polish it up. My second question which is probably a little bit broader and will be more in the design portion of all of this is essentially at RIO and 29 29 is being tunneled out underneath RIO. What do y'all foresee as the engineering methodology to do that since it'll be quite a deep distance to go will that be earth movers will it be explosives what what is used to do such a project? I don't think we're going to blow anything up. No. Yeah it we'll have a little session more on the construction techniques it'll be earth removal. In relative terms not the biggest deal but but let let's let's let the we'll let the information speak for itself and we'll have a little construction seminar on on how that will how that may be done because there again we may get other other ideas of how to do this cut and cover or whatever vernacular term you choose to choose to use there. And is the thought that during that process RIO will still be accessible across 29 or? It has to. Yeah I don't there's no option. Yes that brings up some very interesting design issues that's why I'm looking for. You'll get to you'll get to see it all. You'll get to see it. I'm interested. We're going to make you proud. Okay. Now those are great questions I mean because they're big deals. They're 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 big deals when it's happening to the intersection that feeds your your business and we'll be able to see the general ideas of some of that in these bridging documents right. Bridging documents again apologize for using these terms. Bridging documents are frequently the term that's used for these preliminary plans that are prepared in advance of design build. I don't know why we call them bridging because then everybody thinks they're for bridges. I'm really pleased that the following design build approach I think the least of time will be less impact on businesses. Absolutely Mayor. The design build process 
will reduce the amount of time that it takes to deliver these projects. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, yes, a, a question, and, and again, I think too, um, narrowing this time by using design bill will really help in the long run. I think it does put some challenges on us, though, because it's going to mean a lot of work happening in that short yeah, period of time. It is. Where would be the right venue to begin discussions? The MPO, the city, and the county have already started talking about the need for outreach mm -hmm. for businesses, for the traveling public, and for the citizens <coughs> in the neighborhoods beyond the good outreach that VDOT already does on their projects with, with traffic management. You know, We've taken a look at some other places, Madison, Wisconsin, a couple places in California where they have, have taken and, and offered you know, information to businesses, how to survive a construction mm -hmm. project at your, your front door. Where would be the, the appropriate venue to begin those type of discussions? Would it, would it be with this group, with VDOT, or you know, should the MPO city and county just begin that themselves? Well, I mean, those are all good. Those are all good suggestions. I think this is part of that venue. It doesn't have to be the only place it takes place. Uh, you know, as, as we mentioned, the, the county uh, has constituent, the elected officials of the county and the city have fiduciary responsibilities to their constituencies to have some of those kind of conversations. This may be a good place to collect ideas and say to VDOT, well, here's a, a collective of ideas that we think would be valuable for you to administer. But at the same time, I think by the nature of your job, you're going to be doing it. The county's going to be doing it. Uh, and the, the city will do it as well. I think what would be valuable, and this might be this might be a good place for that, is to sort of be clear about the who's doing what, so that everybody's not doing the how to survive construction brochure, and you have three of those, and they're all di they're all di they're all different. Um, you know, we we should certainly talk about that here. We may want to hear from v VDOT. Uh, in a in the next meeting or so, well, what do you plan on on doing? You know, for for example, and this is a fact, so I can share it with you. You know, they've taken their district communications manager and said these projects are so important that we're stationing you in the Charlottesville residency uh, to handle communications on this project. That's, I mean, that's a pretty big step. Somebody's got to fill in loose shoes back in Culpeper. Um, so I, I think this would be a good venue to get ideas out on the table that bubble up from, from your various constituencies. Yes, sir. Uh, going back to Henry's comment, it doesn't seem that you all could be, VDOT could be this far along without having a, a drawing of that great separated interchange? Um, uh, they couldn't, but they do. Uh, there's a general drawing of the great separated interchange that was based on some general line and grade that work that we did as part of the first panel. We took a look at some uh, some general line and grade to know where the limits of the through traffic uh, would be. We took a general look at uh, does it or doesn't it fit within existing right of way. We did some lane configurations on turn lanes. So there is some of that, some of that general work uh, available that, you know, I didn't even think about that. I should have really made that last package perhaps available to you all because it has some of that general information in it. And I, I can certainly do that. I think that would help a lot. Yeah. The 
Yeah, it's on it's on the website, and I'll point it to you. But it's easy enough for me to send to you as soon as I get as soon as I get back. Or send a link. Yeah, yeah, I can send I can send a link, or I can send a PDF as well if you want to you want to look at it. What you'll see is a uh, a a rendering of how that inter well, you'll see a an aerial of how that intersection is now, and a rendering of how it could look with the grade separation. And I would tell all of you in advance that when you look at the rendering, it's not just a made-up picture to make it look good. There's some engineering behind that work that's been rendered to create the picture. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll do that. Okay. If I don't do it tonight when I get home, I'll do it in the in the morning. Phil, uh, you know that I've reviewed those drawings. Oh, I know. I mean, I found them totally and utterly inadequate because they actually tell you that you're going to maintain traffic on 29, with essentially <coughs> one lane open right here on the southbound uh, inter side of the. Rye Road intersection. Also, the way it's drawn uh, in assuming that all those buildings stay in place, mm -hmm. you would have to cut traffic on Rye Road for several months. And I'm sure <coughs> you're not going to do that. <laughs> the way the drawings are, it's implicit. Well, so it that's is. why I'm so anxious to sure. see it, the drawings, the real drawings, it, not it, these. It is, sim it is simplistic. It's simplistic in that sense, but it's also a rendering of the after situation. It's not a maintenance and um, protection of traffic pl plan. Well, so, uh, if that's the after, uh, we want to know the in between. No, I understand. And sure. maybe the after should also be different because I think it alluded to something very important. What's a master plan? Mm -hmm. Uh, we may not want this as the finished product because we will never get a real substitute for the bypass because the whole exercise really is a substitute for the bypass. Well, and without a master plan that does substitute for the master plan, uh, what are we doing? That's what Ed was saying. It's one off. Well, the the, the only thing I can say get a master plan. is I I will share. There has been some engineering done. Obviously, very early. We did it over the space of eight weeks. I mean, uh, uh, very, very early, but enough to know that this can be done. And that I'm very comfortable with. You can see some general depictions of how that would look after afterwards. I agree the between now and then is very important, and we'll have an opportunity to discuss that further. The only other thing I would say, though, is that whether or not it looks exactly like that picture, we're going to have some different analysis for traffic and some more details, and we'll have that information. But we're here to deliver that package of projects, and that's what we're that's what our charge is, and that's what that's what we're about. So. To the, to the extent that delivering this package of projects should certainly not conclude the normal transportation, preclude the normal transportation planning process. Our job is to give John and his team, and actually Dave, uh, who will be leading up the technical team. Dave Covington is our new Ben Manel for this. <laughs> Dave doesn't appreciate what that means yet. He will soon. Uh, Would it be possible for VDOT to present to us how you're going to manage traffic during this? I mean, we are very concerned mm -hmm. that the, the re revenue is going to be lost because people are not going to want to get on 29. And if you're doing Burkmar and Hillsdale at the same time, you might as well, they're going to go to Waynesburg, and there is no way they're going to fight one lane in each direction. Well, I think, John, what we, can, we could have 
in advance are some general thoughts about maintenance and traffic, but we really want to see those plans from the, from the contractors and what, what are their thoughts and their ideas. I think what are the value of our input in advance is to say, well, here are the outcomes that matter to us. Here's outcomes that matter to us during construction. Here are features of maintenance and traffic, maintenance of traffic that are important. I apologize for using projects out of the area, but for example, when we did the Springfield interchange, we told contractors, look, no matter what you do, you've got to maintain throughout construction, you have to maintain the existing number of lanes that are out there now. There can never be fewer lanes of traffic moving that are out there now. Now, with a couple exceptions of setting big beams over I-95. Uh, so we may be interested in saying to VDOT, here are some, here are some items that are, that are just critical to, to us. Uh, and then we're going to have to hear back from VDOT, yeah, those can be done, they can't be done, and here's why. So I think we've got to get to that point to where we start to see what some of these, those plans we don't have. We can see what some of those maintenance of traffic plans are. Uh, I know how important they are to VDOT. I know I've got a good idea of how important they are to, to you all. And as we see them early, we'll be able to provide more, more input. <clears throat> Um, if we can, if we can move to item six, and maybe maybe it's kind of taken care of its, itself. You know what? How will we know we've met our? How will we know we've met our charge? The success factors for the first panel had a different context, I believe, than than this panel. But I thought it was important that you had the opportunity to, to consider that. How, if, if our charge is to advise the VDOT during the development and delivery of the package of projects on matters regarding design, environment, construction, maintenance of traffic, and public safety, how, how do we get to the end and know we were successful? I mean, I guess one way could be VDOT accepts every recommendation. <laughs> but I don't know. Don't want to put John in that box. Any thoughts about, about that? Is it important to have that list for our work? I don't, I don't know. Well, it, we'll capture it. It depends who it is important to. And uh, maybe some of it may just be an impossible wish or desire. Well, that's okay. That to me is that once everything has been done and has been built, that at least 80 to 85 percent of the traffic in front of our driveways of all the business on Long 29 near the intersection uh, is still there. Well, okay. Than 10 percent. Okay. Because if we're just going to have this one lane and we're going to get, you know, 10% of the original traffic, it's not that you reduce your income and you make less money. You go out of business because there's a crossover. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows about you know, the variable cost and so on, where the business are no longer sustainable. And that is really the biggest worry. Construction is going to be bad. Mm -hmm that after construction can be as bad or worse because the business are no longer sustainable on the little amount of traffic that is left on that one lane. And that's the concern. So, so after construction, if, if we operate generally in this ratio of 85% local traffic and 15% through traffic, uh, that after construction, the 85% of the local traffic is still on the local road. That's, okay. That would be an okay. ideal goal. Well, I, 
how we're going to accomplish this okay. will take a lot of creativity. Well, I, I think that's a that's that's a good statement. Any any other any other thoughts? Uh, that 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 one wraps up a lot. Well, in addition to that, and that's a very good point, but our elected officials that are here know that about 40% of the tax revenue for Almar County is derived from what we consider <coughs> our main street, this corridor. Okay. And so when our revenue is going to go down, so do the tax coffers, and then they're going to have to appeal to the citizens to raise their real estate taxes to make up for the lack of revenue to provide the services that are needed. So. It all comes hand in hand. This is a very difficult situation, very complicated. I agree with Henry 100%. If we can, if we can get back to the, the levels of traffic that we now okay. have when this is finished, well, I think we'll all be happy. And, and, and uh, again, the, the construction will be tough, but we've weathered through that the winding process 20 some years ago, and some businesses did go mm -hmm. under as a result of that. They just couldn't survive it. So, so the ratio now is about 40. I think it's 60. I thought it was 40 percent. I, I believe it's 60 percent. Whatever it is, it's a high number. You would want to maintain that ratio, whatever, whatever it is. So where Henry sort of talked about traffic, we're talking about the dollar, the dollar size tax revenue of that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think maintaining the same number of lanes that exist now during construction should be a goal. I mean, if what Henry's saying about one lane, we can close our store on 29 and move everything out to our other stores. And then we would be shipping our designs crossroads, paying them taxes, not you all, and we can go up 15 and 33 and 20. So this, this traffic issue, it will make other businesses go out of business and it'll make other businesses move, and probably out of the county. So I think Chuck's, everyone here that's a business person mm -hmm. just does not understand how they can do that. That maintain the traffic lanes, maintain our customers, and you know, for us to be able to ship. M maintain the number of lanes or the number or, or the access, the local access. Number of lanes. Number of lanes. And the access. Well, and essentially, that we, yeah, we traffic can flow. Access, that, yeah. that local traffic, traffic still property. flows in front of our driveways and not flow somewhere else. If we still have the same number of lanes, they can't access the property, you know, because of equipment or whatever. I can't but, get in and do business. I will tell you that d during construction is not going to be like not having construction. That that but but I think these goals are important to help shape desirable outcomes, and we'll just have to continue to consider to what extent we can we can meet we can meet. Uh, I've been part of some tough projects in this state and other states, uh, admittedly, some go a lot better than others, but they they can go, they can go well. They can't go without a band-aid or two through the process. And not uh, only maintain after the project, but again, during yeah, the I, no, that's why I heard. once shoppers get that new shopping habit of going wherever, mm -hmm. then we're going to get that after the project's finished. Mm -hmm. If that happens. Yeah, you yeah. don't want to, your customers check out the competition. We don't want that. No. <laughs> well, you said when they were doing the Chesterfield project, they maintained all, all the lanes. Springfield, the Springfield, Springfield Interchange had a lot more room <laughs> and bought a lot of right away. Uh, right. But they did. They did. Yeah, they did. 995, they, they did. We did. Yeah. Those are some potential issues here. About, yeah. you know, how do we do that? Today? Yeah. Okay. Why do we need to do it? And, uh, so anyway, I don't want to take up all the time. Okay. Well, I think uh, as far as the proposal, when you evaluate the proposals for construction, I mean, that should be one of the criteria that they maintain some level of access and uh, flow. 
Yeah, I think this is part of what Henry was talking about, too, in these preliminary documents. It's a good set of preliminary design build documents, in my mind, don't tell the contractor how to do things, but it says what you want out of it. What? What? Not how, but what? Not how, but but what? And we'll see the what's, uh, and and we'll have an opportunity to evaluate. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to eva evaluate. You know, the qualifications are one thing, but the hard work comes once a group of firms is shortlisted, and they are saying, "Here's how we would do would do it." And we'll have a chance to evaluate. Yeah, Mark. I, I was going to say, when I read the charge and what we're talking about here, I appreciate what everybody's saying, this is really about unforeseen consequences. This is how do we avoid unforeseen consequences? There's obviously going to be a hardship during construction. Mm -hmm. Can we anticipate what those what that consequence is going to be? Can we plan for it as best we can to mitigate it as best we can? Can we anticipate what will happen after the project's finished? We plan for that as best we can. Uh, that's very well put. Very well put. So we got maintain 80 to 85 percent of the traffic uh, on the local roads. Uh, maintain the percent of revenue, and maybe we'll work to get what that number is if it's 60 or if it's 40 or something something else. Uh, Maintain the number of lanes of traffic and access points during construction. Do a good job of anticipating and planning. What are the risks and how can, how we can mitigate mitigate them? Any others, Eddie? Oh, one thing I was I want to focus on. I can stand with some of the business people saying about traffic calls right now. As far as 29 being congested during the weekends and and during the daytime, a lot of people actually stop coming in to saddle of Charlottesville to these stores because now they're going to Richmond, Waynesboro, you know, to the restaurants or short pump and all that because they don't want to deal with 29. I mean, as far as the plan, to me, my analogy is we're making, you come in 29, you're making the pot bigger to accept more, but I think the spout is not putting enough water out for the traffic to detour. That's how I look at it. It's not putting, the spout is not still putting the same amount of water out. It's going to be, to me, it's congestion, but that's my opinion. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's about 20 to 4, and I mean, we can stay here just like we told the last panel. I'll stay here as long as you want to stay here. I know how busy you are I'm trying to keep these things in two hour windows if that's, that's not to force an agenda or force a time limit. It's trying to be respectful of your, of your time. Please, please believe that. I, I mean, it's a pretty good list. It's a pretty good list. I mean, it says a lot there. Uh, if we want to add to success factors, we, we can. Uh, this is a very dynamic uh, dynamic process, but I do, if it's okay with you, I want to spend some time on the on our future meetings and make sure, see if we have some agreement around uh, around the frequency, and if we do, I'd like to get a list out to you of, of a schedule of meetings. The last panel, we were kind of able to just go from meeting to two weeks to two weeks to two weeks, but we're, we're going to be around for, for a while. I've taken a look at a schedule and preliminarily tried to dovetail it in with what I think are final schedule from, from VDOT will be, and I will say this, bet, between now and the end of the year, I don't believe, I believe it would, would be prudent to plan for every other week. Uh, we're going to miss some, we're going to miss some oppor opportunities. If everybody can't be here every other week, I, I'm not too worried about, about that. Uh, I, I, I only found one place initially where there might be a little anomaly. Uh, we've got three Thursdays, 
in, the, in October, and if we met in a two-week sequence after that, we'd meet on Thanksgiving, which I'm guessing is not uh, something we, we want to do. But uh, if you believe that every two weeks, if you're agreeable, that every two weeks sounds okay, and if Thursday is an okay day, I will draft what how I would see our schedule falling out and and send it to you for between now and the end of the end of the year. Uh, I can I can do that and get that to you tomorrow and say here's a tentative schedule and then get your feedback on that. If is Thursday okay? Yes. Yes. Thursday's okay. Is I can't remember why we started at two o'clock at this time. We started at one. It doesn't matter to me whether it's in the morning. Uh, look, I'll be if it's after six a.m. in the morning. I'm I'm good. So is morning better than afternoon? Uh, is afternoon good? Is two o'clock is good? We got something done. Okay. 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 Then I'll I'll. I'll send out tomorrow uh, to you how I could see the schedule falling out. It would generally be every other week, except with a little twist at the end of October and November to get us around Thanksgiving. Uh, so there might be one interval there of three weeks between October and the first meeting in November. And by doing that, we could dodge Thanksgiving, but still meet twice in November. Uh, and then I'm going to have a good chat with John and Dave on this information flow, Morgan. Uh, last time, for, for, for those of you that weren't here, last time we hit a pretty good rhythm on having a meeting, having a technical team review on Friday, work through the weekend, reviews on Monday, getting information back to the panel in advance of the next meeting, it, we're going to do our best at, at that through through this uh, as, as well. Uh, okay, I'll get that scheduled out to them to tomorrow, as well as the last presentation that was made to the Commonwealth Transportation Board, which included some of those for whatever their for whatever value you deem they have, it included some of those uh, drawings. Okay. Uh, wrap up. Okay. Uh, does it have to be here, or could it be maybe in the Rosette Library, which may be more convenient for some of us. Plus, if we want to walk out and look at what we're talking about, it's just uh, a few minutes away. Oh no! Well, I've, I've, I mean, we can, we can do that. I've spent a lot of time looking at what we're talking about. The, the advantage of can it be somewhere else? Yes, provided we can figure out how to do the live streaming, so the technology has to be there. This room is set up for it, and it, it's that's an important element to VDOT. VDOT is using us as a bit of a test case. I mean, we've made some changes in how VDOT is doing communications. For example, after we started live streaming our meeting, VDOT said, hey, you know what? We better start live streaming the Commonwealth Transportation Board meeting. Uh, I don't know about I'm I don't know about the Northside Library. It's a suggestion. If it can be worked out, we can look into. We can we can look we can look into it, but we'll just kind of plan for here. And uh, but we will look into it. This is the the networks. The, we can we can look. I don't. I don't know that this If it can be done, that would be great. Okay. If it can't be done, well, okay. we keep coming in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Karen, any wrap up?
that issue is a lot of questions still okay. to be answered in solution. Okay. Jim? Good. John? I'm fine. Okay. Uh, wrap up for me would be what some of the business folks on this council stated today. If we have a plan, uh, knowing when a lane is going to be closed, when it will reopen, our merchants can say 10% off for the next two weeks while we're having difficulty getting you in here. We can't have 20% off for eight months. We need communication to know when the lanes will be closed and when they will reopen. So yes. communication and planning to the community, whether it's through the news outlets or emails or whatever, as long as they know what's going to happen right in front of their store, their office, I think it's really important. Okay. That'll be very helpful. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Mayor? I want to agree with Mr. Lebo. I think with this a schedule, which I consider very aggressive, communication is going to be incredibly difficult and incredibly critical to success. So I, I think there's a lot of emphasis that needs to be placed on communication here. Well, I, I agree. And to, I mean, dovetail on what Chip said earlier and, and Chuck just said, we're, the sooner we get some feedback and ideas from you, from you all, the, the better. I think we have to, personally, I think we have to look at everything from pieces of paper to social media. There's a, a whole new world out there communicating very differently than the old public hearing days. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I just, wait, okay, no, any wrap up? Any? Okay, thank you, sir. Morgan? Yeah, I just um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think this is very important work that we're doing. Something that Eddie said, we're already seeing business bleed away from the corridor because of congestion, and I think keep our eyes on the prize here. Once we're done with these projects, we're going to a point that Chuck made, but the goal being when we're done, we want to make sure we're still hitting that same point of revenue. I mean, I think what we're looking at here is a way to increase that share of revenue, make 29 better. And so it's, let's let's keep our eyes on on that, that big picture too. Okay. Chip, um, agree. I, you know, I think the the end product and the years after, you know, it'll be a positive thing. It's getting through the difficult times of this accelerated construction, communication. As I said before, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll keep saying it each time. I think, too, the, the communication, the collaboration, and, and the flexibility that the contractor is going to be able to offer here because we are not going to be able to design this out to know what the end, exactly what the end product is going to be. We're going to need that contractor to be able to work with us. Oh, sure. The first Absolutely. day, the last day, and, and understand that, hey, you may have to deviate a little bit because there, there are other things at play here. Well, I know I'm making a pitch for my old yeah. agency, but I think it's admirable that they've asked this panel to stay engaged through construction, and it's not just a get-together to say we formed another, another panel. Uh, look, I really appreciate your, your, your time. Uh, when, when Tim Hulbert and I were talking about uh, business representatives uh, and he gave us a good list to con consider and pick uh, six with the thought of maybe four would say, y yes, uh, it was really great that everybody said yes. And uh, I, got a, I got a couple of notes and phone calls that said, do you realize you just picked six business people who aren't in favor of what you recommended? And I said, yeah, yes. <laughs> but I think that's, that's a good thing. I mean, we've been through that process on the what are we going to do, and there's no better advice that can come from folks that are, that are skeptical because we, we all need to be on our, on our toes and ask hard questions and get the best answers we can with the understanding that at the end of the day, VDOT is going to have a, a package of projects to, to deliver and own that ultimate accountability for, for delivery. But I'm really grateful to continue to be in, involved and uh, it kind of puts a sharp focus on, okay, you made some recommend, recommendations, buddy. They better come to, to pass here. All of you all have my email address and my phone number. 
Uh, I'm a pretty darn easy guy to get a hold of. I do, a, I think, a decent job of keeping track of my email and phone calls. And if I don't answer the phone, I'm not too far behind as soon as I get out of another meeting or anything like that. We are, one thing's going to be a little different this time to make sure we check one box on FOIA that we didn't last time, and it's my mistake. I thought that our video recordation of meetings was, could stand for meeting minutes, but, but our state law requires written minutes. Now, that doesn't mean they have to be long, uh, but Debbie will make sure that we have some summary min minutes that we met, that we looked at certain information, generally what we discussed, and we will keep, uh, keep a record of that. We're not taking votes, so we don't have to record who voted and did did what. But we want to want to do a good job in the public eye, and uh, we'll certainly send those to you. Again, there will be summary meeting minutes, not a lot of a lot of paper. One other question I had for you, and this is purely at your pleasure. We could create some notebooks for you if you would like to maintain paper information. Uh, we'll certainly make as much use of electronic media as we can, but happy to put those notebooks together if it's something that you want to keep track of from meeting to meeting. Happy not to do it. <laughs> the only thing I would ask is that we either do it or not. I'd like to see... Or not do it. I'd like to see a couple. Okay. okay. I'd like to make a also. Okay. I've already filled this All right. Binder. All right. Okay. In the end, work better than... Yeah. 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 things work good. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll when, when you show up next time, you'll see a binder at your desk, and we'll have this material in it and uh, material for the next meeting. And as you know, this material has three whole pledge so we can support it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay, uh, thanks for the group that came, and thanks uh, for, for your time today. I will be following up with Mr. Borches and with uh, Brad Sheffield. And Allison, thank you again for, for being here. I have to go work with you. It says a lot. Thank you. Adjourn. Travel safe.